about famous vegetarians, Leo Tolstoy, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, <clears throat> Buddha, quite an exciting scene with the poisoned mushrooms, and then uh, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. And we had invited uh, Rin up <clears throat> to one of our Mid-Hudson Vegetarian Society events to do the plays. And it was very simple but satisfying way he did it. He talked a little about the plays, and then uh, he had people volunteer to read different roles. Well, none of the guys that we had there wanted to be Dr. John Harvey Kellogg and moving things along. I said, I'll do it. And afterwards, Rin said, you are the best Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. <laughs> Um, every year at Summerfest, uh, I do Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, and I've emailed him and said, please don't let the tradition of Rin's plays go. I will be happy to, uh, to take it over, so I hope that they uh, do allow that. And I, <clears throat> we all have our reasons to feel sad. I told him, you know, it's been a few years since you've been up to Rhinebeck. We're going to have you back in 2014. Uh, Lori and I have done this together before, and we'll do it again. Come on up. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg was the one who founded the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and he was a uh, yeah, he was a uh, physician who was known for his abdominal surgeries, but he really didn't like to do them. He had other ideas. So, the scene: a doctor's consulting room at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Time: late 1930s. And a slightly hypochondriac patient, Mary. She's imploring Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, the greatest abdominal surgeon of his time, to operate on her. But Kellogg, unlike modern medicos, views surgery as a last resort. Other doctors have told me I have gastroenteritis since you are the world's foremost abdominal surgeon, I'd like you to operate. Well, Mary, before I operate, I want you to try changing your diet for a week. If the symptoms persist after 10 days, then I'll consider the surgery. I repose all my confidence in you. I know that in all your years as a gastric surgeon, you've never had a mortality. To what do you attribute your unequaled record? I attribute it to the fact that I put my patients on a vegetarian diet before each surgery, which then often obviates the need for the surgery. And I take the precaution of washing my hands before each operation. <laughs> you know, many surgeons neglect to do that. Well, I would much prefer to try your vegetarian diet. I see that I'm in good company. Isn't that Henry Ford, the motor car manufacturer? And Montgomery Ward, the department store magnate over there? Mm -hmm. What will breakfast be like? Oh, my patients usually start the day with fresh fruit and a bowl of flaked cereal. You know, Kellogg's cornflakes. <laughs> flaked cereals? I've never had them. What about coffee? Oh, we serve a coffee substitute. I invented it. It's made from cereal. Hmm. What about lunch? Oh, there's no lunch served here. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm hungry, could I get a cold cut sandwich? No, no. Animal flesh is never served in the sand dining room. My patients like to eat sandwiches containing another one of my inventions, peanut butter. Peanut butter? What is that? Well, it's special. It's a spread made from crushed peanuts. Ah. Oh. Well, what about dinner? Oh, for dinner we serve fresh fruit, salads, vegetable soup, mock meat made from nuts and grains, and of course more peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> that sounds frightening. <laughs> I've never gone a day without eating meat. Ah, oh, Mary, don't worry. Fruits and vegetables contain all the essential amino acids. You've never had that question before. You'll derive all the nutrients you need from a vegetarian diet. Most of my patients leave the sand 
converted vegetarians for life. For life? I think I'd rather have the surgery. <laughs> oh, now I want you to try my program of biologic living for 10 days. If at the end of that time you still have symptoms, oh, then I'll, I'll proceed with the operation. What is biologic living? It's the name of the program that I have specially devised for my patients. They spend at least two hours a day doing aerobic exercise and using some of the exercise machines that I have invented. And they spend about an hour in the solarium, sunbathing in the nude. <laughs> <laughs> Will there be men present while I'm sunbathing in the nude? Ah, uh, no, Mary, don't, don't worry. We have segregated facilities. <laughs> The patients attend lectures on vegetarian nutrition, and they have their two vegetarian meals a day in the sand dining room. But I'm a three meal a day person. Oh, we overeat in this country. There's nothing sacrosanct about three meals a day. Our ancestors, who were healthier and sturdier than we are, they took two meals a day. That's the program we follow. Our patients are also encouraged to have daily enemas. <gasps> enemas? <laughs> well, because of auto-intoxication. After a lifetime of eating animal foods, the undigested food tends to putrefy in the gut. <laughs> and that's the most efficacious way to remove it in a hurry. Surgery. It's definitely sounding much more attractive to me. Anyway, I'd like to have one of those Kellogg's abdominal scars that all my friends are wearing. Can't we just do the surgery and, and skip all this? I didn't realize that my Kellogg's surgical scars were becoming a status symbol. Listen, Mary, I have a proposition for you. Ten days. Try my program for ten days. If you still have symptoms, I'll do the surgery free, free of charge. Now that is an offer I can't refuse. By the way, can I have one of those coupon books with coupons, you know, the one that gives, you give to panhandlers so they can obtain a free vegetarian meal at one of your vegetarian restaurants? Well, certainly you can. Well, Dr. Kellogg, Thanksgiving is approaching. And you know, I'm accustomed to eating a big turkey with all the trimmings. You do serve turkey, don't you? No, no, we do not. Of course not. Didn't you know the custom of serving turkey at Thanksgiving has no basis in historical fact? <laughs> it doesn't? <laughs> Why? I thought it went back to the pilgrims and the Indians, and they did uh, it 1620. all the time. Yeah, Mary, you don't know your history, dear. Do you? It was Abe Lincoln who declared Thanksgiving to be a national holiday in order to bind the nation together during the Civil War. And the Indians would never have served turkey to the pilgrims. They didn't eat turkey. They thought it was cowardly bird. They just used the feathers for decorations. Hmm. Then how did turkey become the focal point of Thanksgiving? It was the Ladies' Home Journal, 1935 that proclaimed turkey to be the national dish. Uh, they were the most influential magazine of the day, and they did it by fiat. Well, what was the first Thanksgiving meal like then? Well, it was a meal such as the pilgrims would never, never have witnessed back in old Europe. It consisted of Native American foodstuffs. The main meal was a sort of cornmeal mush, along with nuts and fruits and Oh, you know, gooseberries, strawberries, plums, cherries, cranberries, and a ground nut known as bog bean. Really good. Popcorn and popcorn balls made by the Indians with maple syrup. That was served as a sweet. There was a variety of breadstuffs, corn pone, ash cakes, oat cakes. The Indians made them from their own recipes. It's possible the pumpkins and squash were served because these were native Indian dishes that the settlers would have been unfamiliar with. The first Thanksgiving was a harvest festival, and that is how we celebrated at the sand. Then I'll have cornmeal mush with cornflakes on top for Thanksgiving. How's that, Dr. Kellogg? It's <laughs> excellent, Mary. That's just wonderful. <laughs> Thank you.
the others are just as much fun, so we're going to do our best to see that the tradition of getting together, reading these plays, and remembering Rin continues. And uh, last night, the last thing I did was take a little look at the Saturday Times in a very short letter. And someone said Rin loved Indian food, and the writer must be Indian because his last name is Maharaj. And this was in response to an article Nicholas Crystal had in on the 13th. Uh, read the unhealthy meat market. Aside from the environmental costs as well as the negative effects on human health, given that it's possible to live a healthy life without meat, the central question is an ethical one. Does the pleasure that humans derive from eating animals justify the immense suffering inflicted upon those animals as a result. I have seen erudite essays that say this in 20 pages, and I think this is very, very succinct, and uh, someone used the word unique in talking about Rin, and that's a word I don't throw around a lot, because I had a good high school English teacher who said, unique is not modified, things are not very unique, things are unique, and uh, that was Rin. He did what he did, and. None of the people out there working in the vegan world do quite the same thing. So it's up to us now to keep his work and his philosophy and his joy alive.